Well, hello again. This is Tom Simmons with another installment of Economics with Tully. We're aboard the Slauncha in Freeport, New York, and the topic of today's lecture will be elasticity. We're going to be creating two different videos on the subject of elasticity. One will be simply on the, the concept of what elasticity means. The second one will be uh, one that is much more filled with graphs and numbers and patterns and, and looking at, um, at geometric and arithmetic equations. Today, however, we're just going to introduce the concept of elasticity. This is a series of lectures designed to introduce economic topics to, uh, to the layman. Uh, to the person who um, may not be in an economics class or may be a new student of economics and grappling with these issues for the first time. Elasticity is, is really a very simple notion. It is the idea of looking at the sensitivity of a change in one variable as a result of a change in another. Now, right off the bat that probably doesn't make much sense but if I give you an example for instance elasticity may measure the change in the number of snow shovels that are purchased as a result in the percent change in snowfall amounts we might be looking at the the change in the number of su bottles of suntan lotion that are being purchased as a result in a certain percent change in the temperature. So whenever a change in one variable affects a change in another, usually the number of goods purchased, there's said to be this el elasticity relationship. And we know that um, if you've looked at some of my previous videos, um, or just read some of the most basic introductor introduction to economics textbooks, that economists are often uh, talking about the relationship between price and quantity of a good. As the price of a good increases, the quantity purchased decreases. That's why stores will put something um, on sale, because the opposite is also true. As the price of a good decreases, the quantity purchased increases. If they want to get rid of something, they put it on sale they know that will increase sales. So we know there's this relationship between price and quantity. However, the sensitivity that consumers have to a change in that price is different from product to product. And by the way, this particular type of elasticity that we're talking about right now is called the price elasticity of demand. How does demand change? How does the quantity demanded change for a good based on the change in price? We know the general relationship. Higher prices, not as much demand. Lower prices, greater demand. But the price elasticity of demand, the sensitivity that consumers have, and the willingness to change their behavior is different from product to product. So let's start with one extreme. One extreme is called perfect inelasticity, or perfectly inelastic. Now this is merely a concept. There is no good in the universe that is perfectly inelastic, but it gives us an extreme from which to explain elasticity. A good is perfectly inelastic if no matter what the price is, the amount of good that consumers purchase does not change. Now, there are some goods that are very inelastic. Not perfectly inelastic, but very inelastic. The way we measure elasticity price elasticity is to compare the percent change in the quantity consumers purchase 
as against the percent change in the price. So let me give you an example. If you went to the pharmacy to pick up medications that you need, either to get better or because you have a permanent um, con uh, heart condition or you have diabetes and you need insulin, and you find out when you get to the counter that the price has increased 20 or 25 percent. Chances are you will complain, you will be annoyed, you will be upset, and you will pay it. If the price of insulin increases 20 or 25 percent, it is not likely that consumers will purchase 20 or 25 percent less insulin or that they will purchase the insulin and then use less of it. It is possible that some people may use a little bit less but not 20 or 25 percent less. This is an item that is highly inelastic meaning prices can change wildly it does not mean that you're going to change your consumption of that good wildly. Thinking of insulin and pharmaceuticals is a good way to think of this because the word insulin sounds like the word insensitive, sounds like inelastic. And that's one way to keep it straight in your mind is that an inelastic good is like insulin in that consumers are insensitive to changes in price. It's also true the other way around. If you went to the pharmacy and they had reduced their price, maybe your copay went from $25 to $15, you'd be very happy, but you wouldn't say, oh, let's have some more insulin. You just wouldn't do that. So whether it's an increase or a decrease in the price, a price inelastic good has a fairly insensitive consumer response. And there are a number of goods you can probably think of that are fairly insensitive or inelastic. For many people, gasoline is an inelastic good. The price increases a significant amount and you might decrease the amount of gasoline you use slightly. You'll combine trips. You won't go on an unneeded trip to the store if you know you're going out later. But generally, if gasoline prices increase 20%, you will not decrease your driving or your consumption of gasoline by 20%. You may decrease it by 5%. So that's also an inelastic good for many people. Very often, goods that are, um, that are habits, uh, such as cigarettes, are considered an inelastic good. For many people, um, Alcohol is an inelastic good. They go out to get a six-pack or a 12-pack because they have um, a group of people coming over for uh, to watch a football game, and it's uh, the price is 15, 20 percent higher than they actually thought it would be. They're not going to buy 15 or 20 percent fewer bottles or cans as a result of that. So that's considered a fairly inelastic good. Speaking of which, thank you. You're welcome. My coffee just got delivered. For me, coffee is a highly inelastic good. I'm one of those persons who gets up in the morning and the first thing I do before my eyes are open is I've got that, uh, I got that coffee drip maker thing, dripping coffee, because I'm going to be drinking coffee all day. Very inelastic. And if I'm on the road driving and I stop for a cup of coffee and I stop somewhere where it's ridiculously expensive, like $3 a cup, Chances are, I'm still going to buy that cup of coffee. Now, as I've said earlier, there's no such thing as something that is perfectly inelastic. So, I never like to hear students say things like, oh, they can charge whatever they want, and they're going to get it. That's not true. Because if your insulin was $20,000 a bottle, or if the cup of coffee was $100 for a cup, yeah, I... I wouldn't be buying it. There is a limit. <clears throat> so companies cannot charge whatever they want. However, it is true that when an item sells in an inelastic price range, 
when an item is price inelastic, there is an upward pressure on price because producers know they can charge a higher price and not lose that many sales. The result of that, when they increase price and only lose a little bit of sales, is that they actually increase the amount of revenue coming into the cash register for that good. So they'll lose a few sales, but not many. And in fact, the increase in price will more than make up for the few sales they lose and they bring more revenue into the company. So for an inelastic good, there is always this upward pressure on the price of that good. At the opposite of extreme is something called perfect elasticity. Perfect elasticity is the opposite, meaning the tiniest, tiniest fractional change in price results in enormous swings of demand for that particular good. Now, for very elastic goods, it might be a little, might be a little easier to think of something that if there's a change of a mere one quarter of one cent, it could make the difference between thousands and thousands of sales for that particular good. One of these are the, are the sale and purchase of stocks because much of this is done electronically now and if there are 50 people each trying to sell their stock in, uh, in um, Evinrood Motors and they're all trying to sell it at twelve dollars and one person says I'm willing to sell my stock in Evinrood for eleven dollars and fifty nine cents and somewhere out there is someone who wants to buy a hundred thousand shares. Well, guess which shares get sold to him and which do not. That one cent difference makes a difference in thousands of shares being sold or not. But for more common uh, consumer goods, a better example would be farm products. Most farm products, agricultural products, are not sold in the store by you and, and purchased by you and me. Farm products are generally sold at commodities exchanges in Chicago. If you think about it, when you buy your box of cornflakes and you dump those cornflakes out in the cereal bowl, you don't sit there saying, oh, look, that flake came from Iowa, and oh, oh, that one definitely came from Joe's Farm in Illinois. And this is a uh, number two hybrid queen, and this one is, uh, I don't know, yellow number 63. You don't know what variety corn it is, and you don't know where it came from. And as a general rule, you also don't care. And as a general rule, neither does Kellogg's. What's important to Kellogg's is that they get as much corn as possible to put into their cornflakes at the lowest possible price. And that means if they are buying one million bushels of corn this year to make cornflakes, and there's a lot of corn selling for eight dollars a bushel, but there's also some corn selling at seven dollars and ninety nine and three quarter cents per bushel, guess which corn gets sold? That tiny tiny fraction of a cent means the difference between selling millions of bushels of corn or not. Most agricultural products are seen as highly elastic, not only in the commodity markets where large corporations are purchasing enormous quantities as inputs to their products, but even in the store, even where you and I go. Um, there is a very strong tendency for us to be very price sensitive about um, agricultural products. And if we see tomatoes on sale at a buck forty nine a pound, and right next to them tomatoes that look pretty similar at a buck forty a pound, consumers will go for the ones that are only nine cents a pound cheaper. That generally has been proven true over and over in supermarkets across the country. So those are your two extremes. Price inelastic, where consumers do not change their purchase of a product 
very strongly based on a change in price versus price elastic, often characterized by agricultural goods, where consumers are very, very sensitive to changes in price. Most goods land somewhere in the middle of those two extremes. Most goods are not either highly elastic or highly inelastic, but somewhere in the middle. And I should add that with a price inelastic good, just as there is a pressure to increase price in order for the business to increase revenue, with a price elastic good, the opposite is true. There is a downward pressure on prices because producers know that they will lose many sales if they're just a little bit higher than everyone else, assuming their product is the same in the consumer's mind as everyone else's. This puts a downward pressure on prices and is one of the reasons why the family farm and farmers in general are often in a struggling position when it comes to making a decent profit on their product. As for most other products, it will change from product to product, from consumer to consumer, and from location to location, whether things are generally elastic or generally um, inelastic. And again, what we're generally doing is comparing the percent change in price with the percent change of the quantity consumers want. If there is a perfectly proportional response, in other words, the price of something increases 20% and consumers purchase 20% fewer of that good, a perfectly proportional response is called, a, is called unit elastic. One of the things that's key about unit elastic is that it is actually the price that maximizes the revenue that an individual store will take in for that good. Now that does not mean that that's the price that the store should charge for that good because it's more important for the store to increase profit than to simply increase revenue and we need to keep those two concepts separate. I may increase revenue, um, I may maximize revenue by selling the boat I'm on for $15,000, but if it cost me $25,000 to make that boat, I'm losing money. So profit, of course, is the revenue coming into the store minus the cost of delivering the good, and that's what keeps a store afloat not mere revenue. So the unit elastic price will maximize revenue. That does not mean that is the price the store should charge for that particular good, and I want to make that clear. Now that's the concept of price elasticity of demand. As I mentioned earlier, elasticity refers to a change in a particular variable as a result of a change in another variable. And we've only talked so far about quantity and price, but there are many other types of elasticities as well. For instance, some goods are income elastic or income inelastic, meaning we're not talking about a change in the price of the good, but rather a change in the income of the consumer who was looking to purchase that good. So for instance, there may be, let's take a, uh, a high ticket product, it could be boats, it could be a Harley Davidson motorcycle. If consumers see a drastic reduction in their income because of high unemployment, um, and they still buy the same number of expensive Harley Davidson motorcycles as before, that would be an example of a good that is income inelastic, meaning changes in income do not affect the quantity purchased. On the other hand, if consumers see their income dipping just a little bit and they, and they stop buying those expensive bikes, that would be an example of a good that is highly income elastic. And so sometimes it's not the 
price at all, or a change in price, that is determining the change in the quantity consumers want, but a change in the consumer's own disposable income and their ability to buy something or not. Another elasticity would be advertising elasticity of demand. In other words, how does a change in the advertising budget or an advertising campaign for a particular product affect consumers desire to purchase that product. There are some products that are very advertising inelastic, meaning you could double your advertising budget for that good. It doesn't mean consumers are going to, in, going to double their purchases of that good. Um, a good example of, um, of an advertising approach that is pretty inelastic are billboards. You can double your expenditures on billboards on the highway. That does not mean you're going to double your sales of that particular good. It's a very ineffective means of targeting your audience, usually. On the other hand, uh, you could probably get rid of half of your billboard budget and uh, not lose half your sales, unless it's a very targeted billboard to visitors on a specific roadway letting them know about an important um, highway service that is just around the corner, in which case it, m it might be more effective. But as a general rule, they're not. Um, when a radio station tells you, hey, purchase radio, we have proof that shows that uh, radio works, and when you purchase radio ads, it increases your sales, they're trying to tell you that the advertising elasticity of demand for radio on that station is elastic, meaning increasing your radio advertising just a little bit will see a significant increase in sales. And for producers or for entrepreneurs who are interested in beginning a new product, being able to figure out the advertising elasticity of demand for different modes of advertising can be a very, very effective tool because it enables you to see does it make more sense for me to be spending my advertising dollars in the newspaper, on the radio, on the TV, on home flyers, on billboards, on the internet, or using some other venue of advertising. Another type of elasticity, and one that is probably the most difficult to get a handle on and to understand, but, but might be one of the most significant ones in terms of consumer behavior, is called cross-price elasticity of demand. When we're looking at cross-price elasticity of demand, we are asking the question, how does a consumer's purchase of product A, how is that affected by a change in the price of product B? In other words, we're not talking about changing the price of the good we're examining but the price of some other good. One way to think of this, since we're using the term cross-price elasticity, is to think of a change in the price of that same good in the store across the street. Cross-price elasticity. So I might sell, um, I might sell uh, boxes of, of pasta in my store for a dollar a box and normally sell a hundred boxes a week. And I keep my price the same, but the guy across the street lowers his price to 90 cents and I lose half my sales. Not because I changed my price, I didn't, but because the guy across the street changed his price and all my customers ran over there and bought his boxes of pasta. That would indicate a very high cross-price elasticity of demand. It could also be the case that a, uh, a substitute product has had a change in price. So maybe I keep my boxes of pasta in my store at one dollar a box. But there's a sale on something that could serve as a substitute product for dinner that night such as boxes of macaroni and cheese. Perhaps those boxes of macaroni and cheese 
go down 10%. Price drops 10%. And consumers switch from buying my pasta, which did not change at all, to buying the macaroni instead. That would also show a, um, a cross price, a high cross price elasticity. It would also, from a marketing perspective, show the concept of cannibalization, meaning I lost sales in one category because I promoted sales in another category. Another possibility would be, um, for cross price elasticity, would be a change in the price of a complementary good. In other words, suppose my, uh, if I'm selling boxes of pasta, once again, at a dollar a box, and I don't change the price, but many people buy jars of, uh, of tomato sauce to go with that pasta. And the prices of tomato sauce, for whatever reason, increases by 20%. And consumers come into my store to buy a box of pasta and a box and a jar of tomato sauce, and they see the price of tomato sauce has increased. And they say to themselves, that's too much. I'm not going to purchase the tomato sauce or the pasta. In this case, a small increase in the jar of tomato sauce has affected my sales of pasta, even though I did not change the price of pasta. That is another example of cross-price elasticity. Small change in pasta, uh, excuse me, small change in tomato sauce, large change in price in the amount of pasta purchased in my store. So cross price has cross price elasticity has many different permutations, if you will. It's how consumers change their purchase of a product based on the change in price of a substitute product, a complementary product, or the same product in another store across the street. Now, when we pull this concept of elasticity together, there are some products that go through multiple stages of elasticity. And one of the most intriguing ones is the gasoline that you buy at the pump. When gasoline comes out of the ground as crude oil, and the large oil companies are looking uh, to purchase massive quantities of crude oil to manufacture into gasoline, it is often highly elastic because, quite frankly, um, Exxon and Chevron and BP and Shell and Gulf, as a general rule, don't care whether that oil came from Kazakhstan or Mexico or the North Sea or Canada or the United States. What's important to them is the price per barrel. And if they're buying millions of barrel of crude oil, They'd rather buy it at $69.99 a barrel than $70 per barrel. At that point, crude oil is highly price elastic when it comes to the large companies buying the oil as it comes out of the ground. But after they've manufactured it and put it out on the street, and it's you and me buying that for our cars, it is highly price inelastic because most of us need a certain amount of gas to get to school to get to work to do the things that we normally do and if the price increases significantly we don't drop our consumption that significantly a little but not as large as the price swing so now we've got a product that's gone from highly price elastic when it came out of the ground to the opposite highly price inelastic when it came to you and I buying it. However, throwing another layer on that, gasoline is also highly price, excuse me, highly cross price elastic. I've had um, students of mine do studies of intersections where there are gas stations on multiple corners in, um, in New England. And what we found was that when one gas station drops their price by one or two cents a gallon, that may lead to a, a change in 20 to 40,000 gallons of gasoline purchased every single week. In other words, drivers get to that intersection and they look at the signs. And rather than being brand loyal, 
If one of them is a penny or two cheaper, that's the one they go for. So it's highly price inelastic from the perspective of you and me feeling we buy almost the same amount of gas, even as prices increase. But it's also highly cross-price elastic, meaning the stores are are in high competition with each other because the change of one or two cents means a significant change in the amount of gas being purchased. That's one of the reasons why a profit margin on gasoline for the store, not, not the large oil company, but for the store, is actually very, very tiny. That neighborhood uh, Cumberland Farms, that neighborhood gas station, they actually make a very, very tiny profit margin on gasoline because it's so highly cross-price elastic. And that has really led the, the trend in creating convenience stores to increase the profit margin within those stores since they're not making it on the gasoline itself. So there's a product that goes from elastic to price inelastic to cross-price elastic all within um, the process of delivering one product to the consumer. So I hope that's been uh, helpful in explaining this, pr this process of elasticity. Yes, consumers react. They don't react the same way to changes in prices or income or competition or advertising to every product the same way and, and in every place in the same way. And quite frankly, your elasticity for a good or service is going to be different than my elasticity for a good or service. As I said, coffee for me, highly priced in elastic. I'm going to be purchasing this coffee um, even as the price continues to, to rise. For you, you don't like coffee, it's not an issue. This is Tom Simmons signing off from Freeport, New York, and hoping this has been a helpful discussion on elasticity. Thank you.